everybody, welcome back to 10% True. Very quick introduction for this episode two of the um, interview series I'm running with Disco Dildy talking about his experiences flying the F-15. Um, this interview was supposed to be uh, a single interview for episode two that lasted about two and a half hours. It actually turned into two calls over the course of a couple of evenings and we ended up with about four and a half hours of content. That's really too long for me to publish on YouTube and so as it grew out of proportion, I thought the best thing to do would be to split it into two. So what was going to be one really big episode, two has now become a smaller episode two, still two hours or so, um, and a a smaller episode three. And that's important because as you're going through episode two, uh, Disco will make reference to certain things, certain topics that will not be coming up in episode two anymore because they're in episode three. I don't know if this is all far too complicated, um, but I thought I would record an intro just to let you know so that if you get to the end of this one and you're thinking, wait a minute, I didn't hear about this and I didn't hear about that and where's this, go to episode three um, and uh, watch that uh, as soon as you've finished episode two. Alternatively, you can go and get the podcast version where I haven't split it up and everything is in the same place. Anyway, as always, please uh, like, subscribe. Um, leave a comment, tell us what you think about the content or tell me what you're thinking about the content and um, help us to grow the channel. Anyway, I'll stop talking, let you enjoy. All right, Disco, welcome back to 10% True. Thanks for joining us again on the channel. It's great to see you. Good to see you again, Steve. Last time, we I think we talked for about two hours and we went through a broad range of topics related a little bit to your, your time flying the T-38 as a FAPE and then going on to flying the F-15 and, and we covered a, a bunch of different things. You talked a little bit about, about intercepts, gave us a great description of situational awareness and losing it and how you lose it and how you get it back and the building block approach behind that. Um, and today, I, I would really like to talk about BFM, I'd like to talk about the culture of the Eagle community. I'd like to maybe take it down a notch and talk a little bit about some of the more serious aspects, you know, um, losing friends, um, you know, how you deal with the pressures and the cut and thrust that is being a fighter pilot and, you know, the the finality of their, of a mishap, you know, the pretty good chance you're not going to, you're not going to come back. So, so, and so, you know, maybe we'll mix it up in in respect to doing those things so we don't end up, we don't end up on a downer, but... One thing no. I wanted to, to ask you, Disco, before because because when we were talking in the first interview, you you talked a little bit about some of the squadrons you've been on the, at Bitburg, at Holloman, and then you talked about Schusterberg, and I thought it might be helpful for the audience if you if you could maybe just give us a potted history of your F fifteen career. Then, so where did you start and where did you end up? Well, after being a FAPE, the first assignment IP, an instructor pilot in our, our training command. Um, I went to Luke Air Force Base and was trained on the F-15 uh, in the, uh, the the triple nickel, the 555th uh, Tactical Fighter Training Squadron then, which it which uh, has a uh, very rich history, especially in area combat over Southeast Asia. Um, that squadron during the Vietnam War shot down more North, north uh, Vietnamese airplanes than any other unit. And uh, it, his, his uh, subtitle was the the largest distributor of MIG parts in Southeast Asia. <laughs> so the, those guys trained me. They were all former F four guys, uh, many of whom had flown in, in Vietnam. And then I was assigned to the uh, 36th Tech Fighter Wing at Bitbird, Germany, the 53rd uh, Tiger Squadron, the 53rd uh, Tech Fighter Squadron, known as the Tigers. Uh, because of our uh, our um, our patch uh, emblem, and uh, spent three years there. You know, went to uh, AT-38s in Holloman Air Force Base, back to T-38s to teach fighter lead in a short, uh, relatively short. Uh, we call them. Ep- there are certain words in the fighter pilot. Uh, they are not in the fighter pilot dictionary. The fighter pilot vernacular. Uh, staff jobs are one of them schools such as Air War College, et cetera. Uh, these are just, uh, these are collectively known as S-words. So I had an S-word assignment to, um, to Ramstein on the NATO uh, uh, Allied Air Force of Central Europe uh, staff as the uh, attack eval, t- tactical evaluation um, officer for air defense uh, units in, in the central region, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands. 
Um, and then following that, I was assigned to the 32nd uh, Type Fighter Squadron in Susterberg, which is uh, this one. The, um, the Wolfhounds from uh, the Bizarre is our patch, uh, our emblem, uh, it, as, as well as the tiger, were drawn by Walt Disney's Art Studios back in 1940-41 when these units were established. And uh, so, um, so the squadron is known as the Wolfhounds. The logo, though, is more of a slobbering dog. So that, that's our unofficial nickname is the Slobbering Dogs. Um, we're also known, as I might have mentioned in the last uh, last episode, we're also known as the Dutch Air National Guard. So it was the 32nd Dutch Air National Guard squadron because we were defending Dutch airspace because the, the Dutch at that time couldn't quite do it. Uh, so uh, we, we took on that role. So anyway, so 32nd um, Fighter Squadron, we'll found, uh, after that, another S-Word tour. And, um, after going to an S-Word uh, school and then uh, the vice wing commander of the 33rd fighter wing at Eklund Air Force Base, where I flew with the 59th fighter squadron, the largest distributor of big parts in Iraq <laughs> during <laughs> Desert Storm, <laughs> and the 60th, the, the, the Crows, the 60th fighter squadron there at Eklund Air Force Base for two years and retired from there. So that's, uh, that's the, the lineup of fighter squadrons in my Air Force experience. Excellent. Yeah, I, I thought that would just be helpful to people, especially if they're coming off the back of part one, which they should be. If you haven't watched part one, don't watch this now. Go and watch part one now. Come back and watch this when you've watched part one in two hours' time. But I thought that would be helpful f to people because, yeah. uh, you know, just because you have mentioned Schusterberg, Eglin, and deployment from right. Eglin, and you're not going because you're the vice wing. And I thought, well, let's just lay out what it, what it is. Okay, great. Let's talk about the Eagle. And, and context always matters. You and I know as authors, context matters. You have to establish the context before you address the yeah. whatever you're trying to describe. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Tell us then about fighting the F-15 yeah. against friendly, um, dissimilar air, type, air air combat types. So, so right. um, you know, the, the the big question I have in my mind is that when people talk about the F F-15, they they talk about you know 100, 405 kills to to nil that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's the world's greatest air superiority fighter. Um, you know, indomitable, uh, unbeaten. Was it truly that? So if you were flying against an F-14 or you were flying against an F-18 or an F-16, where were you strong and, and where were you weak? Um, you know, were there times where you were humbled? Uh, were there times where, you know, it was to do with limitations with the aeroplane or is it is it always about the pilot? Just give us a, you know, your, your perspective right. on how that all works. Well, let's start off with this humility aspect that you mentioned because, as you know, it's very hard to be humble. <laughs> when you're flying an airplane as superior, at least in its day and age, superior to, to all comers, so to speak. Um, so, uh, and, and you also mentioned the word relative to, and, and that's what it really is all about. It, it's our airplane, what airplane you're flying relative to your opponent. Uh, they all have very uh, capabilities derived from either their flight envelope their weapon suite, their their sensor suite that allows the pilot and the, and the uh, other crew members uh, so uh, more than one uh, single seat uh, more than uh, more than a single seat uh, type uh, adversary. Um, so you want to obviously use your uh, greatest assets uh, to your advantage and and minimize. The ones that are, are relatively weak, as you said, uh, against your op opponents. Um, the um, when the F-15 was in its heyday in the 80s and 90s, uh, until the arrival of the Flanker, um, there really was no airplane that could could compare with it in every regime of combat. And by regime, I mean from BVR beyond visual range, the location of the enemy airplanes and the ability to shoot them before they could shoot you and the ability to, to get out of the uh, dire situation as you were approaching the merge, the visual arena. So that, that's one regime. The other regime, of course, is the uh, visual arena itself, which is boils down to dogfighting. Uh, and finally, there's the, uh, the, uh, 
the getaway factor. Uh, the third regime is being able to to leave a a, a combat on your own terms uh, and get away successfully. So to take those, uh, if, if the, the smart fighter pilots will take those, you know, when they're facing a, a, a dissimilar adversary, take those and see what their, the advantages are and exploit them. For instance, the radar range of the F-15 in the 80s uh, exceeded all except for the Tomcat. But the Tomcat, its AUG-9 uh, system, was designed against bombers, bear bombers, badgers, and uh, carrying anti-shipping uh, cruise missiles and, and other you know, maritime operations uh, weaponry. <laughs> and so it would... So it, it had some uh, some very large blind zones because it was tuned, if you will, to a certain speed, and its look down uh, capabilities required a, a flat surface uh, ground return, meaning water, so that the radar would not be the radar uh, echoes would not be returned to the transmitting antenna, but would bounce off beyond the target into space. So over land. You could not, it didn't really have a, an effective look down sheet down capability. Um, the, uh, so the other thing was that the Phoenix uh, was again a bomber destroyer missile. Uh, and there was a lot of intricacies in it that made it effective in that role. But because it uh, required updates to track the, in, the in approaching uh, target, if that target uh, changed course, and as the AUG-9 was, was uh, time-sharing against several targets, because the, the Soviets were not going to send a, sol a solitary bomber against a carrier task force. There would be multiples. So the radar would share, well, all the targets that saw it would share time with each one. Well, if a target changed course by as little as five degrees and was not at the expected uh Location when the radar returned to to reacquire it and data and uh, update it statically to for that target, then it went blind. It just dropped that target. So because because the nature of its design, uh, if you were approaching the, the uh, an F fourteen as adversaries and you were lower than them, then it then at certain points just a 10, 15 degree check turn. One way or another, you could still maintain progress towards the, the Tomcats, but you could defeat their radar because you would not be where the radar expected to see you at its next look. So anyway, th th that's probably a lot, a lot of technicalities to just say that the F-15, although it had a, its radar was not as powerful and as long range as a Tomcat, still you could get in close, close enough to employ ordnance. Um, Without, without uh, the Tomcat call, uh, um, calling a, uh, I can't remember what what their they had a call for watching the Phoenix, uh, like Brutus or Bruno or like you were sicking a uh, a Rottweiler on a on an unsuspecting child. Uh, so so anyway so, and and of course all other airplanes the F-15 could get in close. Uh, the F-4 had no look-down capability. Uh, the F-18, uh, when it came out after the, the Eagle, uh, it had about two-thirds because of, because it's, the electrical generators on its engines could not provide the same level of power, the same amperage of the electrons that are sent into the air. Then its, its uh, radar was limited by the, the power output of the engines, of the radar, which is driven by the engines uh, generated. So you had about a, let, let's uh, just arbitrarily say that an FFT, an F4, an F15 could see 40 miles. F18, probably 25 to 30. So you had a, at least 12 miles in there to, to find the target and figure out how you wanted to attack him before, he, before you ever showed up. On his radar, the F-16, the early model F-16, same problem, a single engine, and it's and a small radar dish in the nose. Then its uh, effective uh, search range was about 50% of the F-15. 
So, so if an F uh, 15 can see 40 miles, the Viper can see 20. Well, you can do a lot of things and, and before you get to 20 miles to ensure that you're going to, uh, to intercept them, you know, as far off the nose as possible. Uh, cause that's where those guys would be looking. So anyway, so in the BBR environment, you compare radar ranges and you compare effective missile, uh, flyout ranges, uh, cause you want to have, uh, you want to, you want to go fast, shoot first, and check six. Those are the uh, the uh, trifecta of uh, the litany, if you will, of uh, how you approach a, a fight. Uh, go fast, <laughs> shoot first, and then uh, check six. The uh, the B the BFM of, in uh, visual arena, of course, is uh, is a lot more dynamic, not nearly as uh, Shall we call it engineering? In other words, using uh, numbers, ranges, azimuths, altitude, deltas, and those sorts of things to figure out where you do have an advantage. Um, but more of the um, you know, the, the turning uh, capabilities of the airplanes. Um, to go back to to the Tomcat, the Tomcat was uh, again it was designed as a as a, uh, a bomber destroyer. Specifically, a bomber carrying uh, uh, anti-ship missiles. Uh, the uh, the the swing wing, the uh, variable geometry wing, wasn't so much for combat maneuvering as it was to get swung forward to get such a heavy airplane off the deck of a carrier uh, in a catapult launch and back on the deck of a carrier safely. So that's why the wings come out, right? Uh, uh, and when they are out, then that gives uh, that gives uh, the airplane more lift, uh, uh, and therefore in BFM engagements, more turning capability, faster nose rate in terms of uh, turning. Uh, a lot of people would say that that it, that that gave the airplane an advantage. Well, not over the F-15 or the F-16 or the F-18. Uh, maybe perhaps a little bit over the F-4. The um, the um, what it uh, really did uh, uh, was it gave its it gave itself an advantage over what it would be like if the wings were back, like as a as a delta. So so the relative thing there is yes, and that's why and that's why the uh, the swing wing was so advantageous for the Tomcat to go after bear bombers because you needed to intercept them before they lost their cruise missiles. Which meant you needed a lot of speed to get as far out away from the carriers to intercept them before they could launch the cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's that that's why the F-14 has its its uh, swing wing uh, uh, technology. The problem with it, in terms of uh, BFM, is one of the settings on the wings is uh, the maneuvering setting, and. Uh, you get to see a little bit of that in the first Top Gun movie where the wing will come out from its delta, its high-speed delta configuration. It will start coming out to maintain the best leftover drag ratio for the airplane uh, at that speed, that altitude, and that weight. Well, it, fighting the F with the F-15, we, we typically would be able to get in close, uh, get within visual range uh, before they could actually start employing ordnance. Uh, and after the first pass, the F-15 could do, we could square a corner. We could square a corner once. Uh, and we could square a corner, get behind his uh, uh, his uh, 39 line, and then you could you could just watch as as the F-14 would be going into a, into a turn, the wings would be progressively swinging out. We refer to that as the uh, the great airspeed indicator in the sky, because it told you what his energy level was. By the time the wings got perpendicular to the airframe, he was close to virtually on stall. And then all you have to do is throttle back, saddle up, and turn on the gun. <laughs> so so now, uh, and because of that, the uh, the F fourteen was known as the turkey rather than the tomcat. Because it, it was big, heavy, bulky, had, had little bitty wings that would come out at, trying to fly, 
um, kind of like a T-Rex, you know, trying to, trying to play poker. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so that was, the, that's how you would evaluate the Tomcat. The F-16, on the other hand, that thing could, pardon my fighter pilot vernacular, but it could fly up its own asshole. <laughs> so you wanted to avoid getting into a turning fight with an F-16. So it was just like uh, when in early in, in the, the Second World War, when the uh, democracies typically had airplanes that were not as maneuverable as our, as our adversaries, you learn to do hit and run tactics. Again, stay fast, shoot first, and check six. Uh, when the F-16 before Amram, Amram was the great equalizer among all air air fighters. Uh, if if you could if you could get it, uh, so in, before Amram, all you had to do was stay outside of an AIM nine envelope. So so you hit the merge, and if you hadn't if you did not have advantage, and the advantage because this is the visual arena. The advantage is if they don't see you. If they don't see you, press the attack. If they do see you, they're reacting to you. It's an aware bandit. Then uh, find an exit into the third regime, and that is to leave on your own terms. Don't stay and try to BFM because uh, an F-16. Because if you met 180 out and both of you went into a turn, then the, the, next, the next merge, he would have about 30 angles on it it's still it's looking promising especially if you're using the vertical effectively uh but remember the f-16 has the same thrust to weight ratio very high uh, that the eagle does so so if you take the fight up he's going to go up with you if you take the fight down your turn radius is going to get larger as you can uh accelerate down the and and he because it's the fly by wire system has got an optimized wing uh, then he's going to he's going to sustain the same uh, turn radius at high G's. So mm. that's not leaving on your own terms. So anyway, so so that's the uh, the um, the difference between BVR, shall we say, against the Tomcat, and BFM against the Tomcat versus uh, BFM versus Viper. Every time we went to uh, the similar um, against the similar. NATO adversaries, adversaries in the training sets. For instance, the Mirage F1. We would we would research in the in the squadron weapons shop. We would research the uh, flight envelope, the weapons suite, the uh, radar look, uh, all of the all of the pertinent uh, items uh, about the adversary. And then we would, what we would try to do for our own training is is decide what Soviet airplane bet it best replicated. Well, which one did it match most closely? Uh, for instance, the Mirage F1 and the French uh, F1 that we, we trained against in, uh, in France, but then fought against it in Iraq, um, it best replicated a MiG-23. The radar uh, parameters that, that it possessed were very similar. Uh, now, there were some uh, similarities with the uh, with uh, the radar missile. The aphid was a lot like a magic in terms of its envelope or turning capability, although it was smaller because it's a smaller rocket motor. Uh, so we would go against it, not just to you know pound our chest and go, "Oh, we beat you, we beat," you, but to get valid and valuable training out of each encounter. Well, I flew against um, lightnings. At, um, up at Bibro. and that was like that was like fighting a MiG twenty one. That's how we we looked at it, and and then you know certain visual aspects and say, oh yeah, it, it even looks like one, but just a notch out of the wing. Uh, but it's very similar to the uh, to uh, the later models of, of the MiG twenty one. Uh, so so I don't mean to put down um, you know everybody uh, in any way. It's just that each has its own advantages. Uh, and disadvantages in and of itself inherent, uh, which we tr tried to export the disadvantages um, and um, and enhance our own advantages. So I hope that kind of covers the waterfront for back then. The MiG-29 are arriving on the scene. Uh, as I might have mentioned last time, intelligence, uh, Air Force intelligence built that airplane up as uh, 
as as the eagle beater. Uh, and as it turns out, no, not so much. Uh, it, it, uh, it had a lot of limitations that uh, that we were not initially aware of, uh, and I bought them at Cold Lake, on one of my last deployments um, uh, up there, Maple Flag, um, and, and it, it had a, a really uh, ergonomics were awful, and it it uh, it's really a wonder that they they saw anything uh, either on the radar or visually. Uh, but anyway, even that we would go to school on okay, how to fight the MiG-29 because it was really very little more than than a uh, an F-4 weapons radar wep- radar and weapons capability uh, mounted in a small version, a, a scaled down version of a Tomcat configuration with the engines two engines in pods carried beneath the flat belly uh, and, and that sort of thing. It did not have the turning uh, performance of, a, of an F-16, although Intel th- said it was going to. It didn't. Um, anyway, so it, it, take, it takes study. Uh, fighter pilots are not known for being smart, uh, but, uh, you know, we get, if we get smarter af- after, you know, we have a few, but, uh, but uh, we're intelligent enough to know that uh, we're going to win this fight and win meaning is coming back alive. Then, uh, then you got you got to know your adversary, everything about them, and what cards you have in your hand that you can play to uh, to uh, get back alive. If not, bring back you know back some kills or as part of the process. Is there any airplane that you can think of that you'd like for me to describe the F-15 relative to? It'd be interesting to hear. I mean, you know, just you, you've already explained what your career was like, but just to give the audience at home some timelines, you you, you last flew the Eagle in two thousand one, I think it was two thousand two thousand one. So, so right. we're talking about uh, mechanically sta- scanned APG sixty three radar, the suite, whatever the suite was in the jet at that time. You didn't have Jahamics, the helmet. You didn't have you know any True. of the new gizmos. There was no Erst capability they now have that's mounted in, on a sort of little little center line oh, yeah. pod, pod that they've got so so, so it was a very different airplane to today but so, but but from that point of view it would be interesting to hear your comparison with the flanker then because you started this by saying until that came on the scene you were you had the technical overmatch against everything what what did the flanker do to to give you pause for thought uh technically i do not know and i'm not trying to you know uh, be uh uh there's a word that starts with the o that i can't uh, call up right now. I'm not trying to obscure anything uh, because uh, we never trained against the, the uh, flanker, uh, and the uh, written materials were rather academic. Then, and there was never an opportunity to really go to school, as in deploy to a place where you would fight uh, either airplanes uh, could simulate uh, flankers uh, uh, or the real thing. For instance. Um, the uh, the U.S. Air Force's invitation to the Indian Air Force to hey bring your flankers to Red Flag and let's play that was a an, an intelligence coup. Yeah, as you probably are yeah. well aware, uh, we learned so much about that airplane and was it, were able to put it into a proper perspective of what uh, uh, combat against him a well flown uh, flanker would be but i don't have any personal knowledge of those details because i left the air force prior to that let, let, let me ask you another question then and, and this is you you will say you know if you can't answer the question you can't answer the question we will we'll move on but you know my personal fascination with foreign military exploitation we know um as in you know people know generally that in the, the early 90s the air force managed to get hold of some su-27s from belarus and those, I've those heard were, that. You'd heard that. I've heard you? that. <laughs> I, I wondered whether or not, and this this is, I mean, this is this is genuinely a curiosity for me. So, so one of the things that's interesting about Half Pad, which was the MiG twenty three exploitation in nineteen seventy nine, is that they found out it, it couldn't turn for shit, but it was really good at accelerating and it was fast, which was one hundred and eighty degrees out from what the Air Force Intel guys had said they yep. thought it would be. My yep. understanding from talking to F four guys at the time is that they didn't share that immediately. They didn't share that with the TAF immediately, the tactical air forces immediately. So. For a couple of years after that, the Air Force knew that guys were still going out thinking 
that it was a good turner but not that fast and the way to get out of a fight with it was to dive and and, and try and out accelerate it um so, no. so so did you get in the eagle community did you get any information coming from you know certain quarters in the air force to tell you what the true performance of a flanker was 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 no. there, there were no indications no. to you that there was any inside knowledge let's say yeah no, it it and steve uh, and the viewers uh one thing that i i learned in my in my uh a 26 year career in the Air Force as what, and with a, a, a time uh, at the Pentagon, which is uh, known as the uh, five sided wind tunnel, because um, it just blows there, is that the Air Force will uh, tailor its intelligence sometimes to Congress rather than so that we get to buy new toys or upgraded toys. You know, I'm just using a a uh, generic term for airplanes, radars, engines, missiles, uh, optics, air sensors, everything. Uh, sometimes we will uh, tailor, or we would back in the day, tailor our intelligence so that it could be used in set in hearings on Capitol Hill with Congress to get. Congress to authorize and appropriate the enhancements that we wanted. So, uh, or that we thought were necessary. It's not, it's, I don't mean to make it frivolous. It's not frivolous. But th- but it was a political ploy that I, integrity-wise, I really didn't appreciate. But, but, and, and because it was released that way, sometimes that information would get back to the squadrons, and it would be shall we say, uh, uh, different from the book that was coming out of Nellis from the fighter weapons school and the exploitation of, of uh, adversarial uh, uh, platforms. Anyway, so, so to, suffice it to say that you know, sometimes the Air Force would, would uh, n- not be fully revealing or, or transparent in uh, what they were saying about an adversary because we wanted a certain capability uh, that was now on the horizon or on the table from a contractor. Uh, we, want, we needed to buy some of this stuff. Hmm. Anyway, so so no, but all, all of my information really on the Flakers open source, uh, aviation leak and space technology, yeah. uh, that's sort of source and and i don't keep up with it no let, let me ask you another question then related to what you would you were just saying i mean there's a couple of questions um and it was a really you know as as per the last conversation fascinating insight to hear you talk and, and break it down you talked about exiting the fight on your own terms how does you know it might sound like a stupid question but how does that work what what it, what what would your own terms look like um you said you said you don't want to get into a descending spiral fight with the f-16 because then your turn radius is going up he's his stays the same and so therefore it's not in your own terms what would what do you do you just blow through at the merge what, what, what does it mean it it uh when you realize that you no longer have an advantage that's a, that's the time to leap um uh, you don't want to wait until you realize that you that the adversary has the advantage. That's too late. <laughs> so, so there is that. It's like I say, you know, there is that period of time when you arrive at the merge. You know where all the targets are. You know where your wingman is, and you get you guys are you're you're hurting the uh, the enemy around uh, to the point where they become fireballs. Uh, so, but. Uh, that, but if you arrive at the merge and you see that the adversary has already got a lot of angles on you and it's a good turning and adversary, then it's a hard turn to negate his angles, roll out, unload, full blower, go straight down at a, at a steep angle, downhill, and, and, and basically park all of the fight at your 6 o'clock. Now, throttle idle, speed breakouts, to get the, down to t- corner velocity, slam the. Uh, if if you say if you if you you, you feel like you using you your raw gear have strung out the enemy behind you, and now you can take them one at a time instead of a 
a flight of four, a wall of, uh, of adversaries. And now you can come back in and take a one at a time. Uh, and um, Amram's in the face, aim nine's in the face, and, and keep blowing through, uh, passing one firewall after another. Then you have you have left the fight on your own terms. I'm going to park the whole fight at six o'clock, but then I'm going to re-enter with with some situation awareness because I know where they're at. Uh, at least the location is is known. Um, the my description of um, fighting in F-16. Now, uh, the first after the first merge, the second merge, you'll have about thirty degrees of angle. Uh, this, if you continue on equal, then you know how the, you draw it on the board. It's, it's like a figure eight. You're both doing turning circles. Uh, and you meet the same merge, but he will have 60 degrees, which still puts him out. You pass with him in front of your 3-9 line. So you think, oh, yeah, stop, no, I'm still doing good. I'm still doing good. Uh, well, next time it's going to be 90. And the next time he's going to be at 60 degrees off your tail. So uh, which one of those merges do you want to leave at? Uh, I, I will leave at the second merge. In other words, the first merge, sure. I'll take it. See, he, yeah, it, it may be the, the, the guy or the, or, or the woman pulling on the, pulling on the stick that makes the difference. It may be that after the first merge, if I, if I go up into the sun, maybe they lose sight of me and you'll know it because the, what was started as a really tight turn will flatten out. Because now they got to get, <laughs> they've got to get the uh, the blood back up into their into their craniums and behind their eyeballs so they can look around and, and find you again. Well, if you're up in the sun now, you have a extraordinarily. I mean, this goes back to World War One, you know, uh, to uh, the Brown and Company and and von Richthofen. Uh, so now you have plus you have all the, the turning room. Yeah, and it's about this. It's about the size of your lunch box. You know, it's just when you're when you're on your back pulling the nose down, you just rotate that that lift vector where you want to 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 uh, intercept, so that you can employ the AM nine out certain ranges, or even if you have to go in for a gun attack, or even if and say they pick you up again. And they, they flat plate you. They rotate the airplane to where all you see is plan for. He's seeing it. Okay? You're going to go blowing by in the 90 degrees angle up, and you can get away. Especially you can get away uh, by reversing the turn once you're on his belly side and pulling for about 40 to 60 degrees. So while he's trying to reverse, he can't see you or she can't see you. And now you're out in that direction, and they don't even know where you went. Hmm. Um, and, of course, if you see the, the adversary flat plate you like that, Show you plan, all plan for them. Then poke the pipper out in front of them, turn the gun on, and maybe can take a snapshot uh, as you can go through uh, gun parameters. And maybe and maybe there'll be a golden BB in, in that uh, that pack of uh, 20 Mike Mike. And, and he blows up right in front of you. Or it, it scares the, per, the, the adversary probably where they pull out a plane and now they're defensive briefly. And again, allows you that those very few short seconds to come up with an deep rest point. So the, so it's, it's what I learned out, you know, in all those years at the first, when I was first in the F-15, we never left a fight because the airplane was superior to everything. This is before the, the Viper showed up. Once the Viper showed up, it was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe, maybe we shouldn't stick around till we get gun. Um, <laughs> if you could, so maybe, maybe, yeah, and beat our chest about how, how you know all the F-60s were just fireballs on the horizon because we were shooting our our AM sevens. Uh, uh, so uh, so that that made us kind of sit back and go, okay, this is this is a thinking man's uh, uh, contest here, and I'm going to try to use again my brains to uh, to keep myself from from losing my ass uh, in it. So. So yeah, it's just it, it's, and that and that's what all the training does for you. It 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 teaches you again and again and again where's a good time to leave, when you can afford to stay, um, and of course working two ship tactics or even four ship against adversaries, you know that that's a an exponential increase in advantage 
Mm-hmm. Uh, because when you can't, uh, you know, maybe your wingman can't. And we proved that again and again at Desert Storm, where the wingman actually shot down the the adversary that the flight lead was engaged with initially. So teamwork, and you know, so now we're now we're going beyond the the one v one discussions. It's just the training, the exposure, the experience, doing it again and again and again, uh, where you where you learn against this type of airplane, or the, the, this this quality of a pilot. Uh, I better know when to leave if I want to come back. Sorry, no, no, no. This is this is great. I mean, I, I was just thinking, you know, because you you had mentioned sort of multi aircraft tactics and and um, you know more than sort of one v one. So if you're two v one and you're the you're the guy who's outnumbered, are there any special tricks to doing that? Uh, are, you, are you really expected to keep an eye on on two bad guys, uh, or are you you know do you? Well, I don't know. How does it work? You is it a game of chance? Uh, well, first of all, you should never and. And the way fighter pilots uh, express it, the, the first number is always how many are on your side. So you said 2v1, but actually, from my point of view, it'd be 1v2, right? Is that, okay. So are we talking about the same thing? Yeah, 1v2. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, unless I can kill one of them quickly, I won't be fighting 1v2 because I've got to even the odds. Hmm. If, they were, if, if they are flying any sort of... Uh, uh, aware and, and and smart, um, clever tactics together, you know, communicating and, and maneuvering their airplanes independently to achieve the same aim. Uh, if, if they're doing that, then I got no business tied it up with two of them. So, so for me, uh, if I lose my wingman, uh, in terms of visual, um, contact or, situation awareness it is so easy to do you, you're thinking your wing is going one way but actually he, he turned the other and now he's completely gone from where you know so that that part of your essay isn't null and void uh so uh so what's once those situations happen uh, i would be leaving the fight and collecting my wingman on egress i would tell there are to leave I'm out of here. I'm going this direction, passing through this object, uh, wrapping down to the bottom or to the ground level. Um, where are you? Uh, uh, a bullseye uh, location. You know, do do the math or or the maths, plural. Uh, anyway, so uh, so yeah, I would never fight one v two unless I would, could get a quick kill on one, throw him out of the fight. And and then take on the other. Okay, so Disco, we we just talked about one v two. Um, the astute members of the audience will notice I'm wearing a different T-shirt. You've had your hair cut, uh, and even though we had tried to make this look like we've recorded it in one session, we have recorded it in two sessions. Um, but before we talk about two v one, so you know one v two, you're not going to do it unless you can kill the one of the guys first and then take on the second guy. So it's otherwise ill advised. Before we talk about the two v one piece, then. Uh, you told me offline that one of the really critical elements of, of any kind of BFM is being able to max perform the aeroplane. Um, maybe now's a good time to talk a little bit about how you max perform the Eagle, how it talks to you, what max performing actually means. Well, max performing, of course, uh, that has to do with maneuvering. Uh, everything else is straight and level. You know, performance is dictated by uh, by how much how much afterburner you're using. Um, so you'll, in fact, in this video that we'll be uh, commenting upon later, you'll you'll see in the HUD on the left is the airspeed in, uh, uh, indication, and you'll find that these guys are going they're they're going into the fight at uh, about 500 knots. Uh, you you want to be at least 480 true, 480 knots true. What you're seeing on the HUD is indicated airspeed, so uh, 500 knots is Probably close to 560, 570 true. So that is a lot of smash. Um, and that airplane is going to go in a straight line. Uh, and if you try to, to turn it, then um, then you're you're going to have a uh, a turning circle as uh, big as East Anglia or the Netherlands or Nebraska. So so to, so to get down to a cornering velocity somewhere. 
where the uh, corner velocity is where uh, it's the highest speed that you can pull maximum Gs and not over G the airplane. Uh, so beyond beyond corner velocity, higher than that, you'll over G the airplane attempting to pull your maximum Gs, whether that be 9 Gs, 7.33 or whatever the airplane was rated at at the time. <clears throat> so, so to turn uh, and make your quickest, tightest turn, then to match perform the airplane, if you're coming into a fight very, very hot, very fast, then you rip the throttles to idle, throw the boards out, the speed brake, the big barn door that comes up behind you, and and, the, and you can start your turn. And as soon as you can uh, uh, feel the nose dig in, that's, again, that's tactile, uh, then the speed brake comes in, and now it's, it's, it's very key to fly with your fingertips. Because once you get down below 420, then the airplane starts talking to you. And the only, and it's the only way, it's like Braille. The only way you can tell what it's telling you, you can understand what it's telling you, is by the, the feel on the fingertips. This is not an airplane that can be max performed flying it with a, with a, uh, you know, uh, what we call a ham fist. Uh, you know, uh, so... So you got to relax your your grip on the stick and fly it by the by the fingers, which is also very important for pushing all the little buttons on the stick, uh, as well as the throttle, for the the SRM uh, the the heat seeker, you know, to get it to uncage to to bore sight it to to do other things with the weapons, also as fingertip touches, and that's um, you know that's difficult to do if you've got a, a death grip on the stick. So we're always taught, or we're always taught to fly with your fingertips, because uh, below about 400 knots, let's say we're in a very, very hard turn. Uh, uh, I used it is a weight, but I used uh, 385 as corner velocity. If I got down just a little under 400 knots, then I could pull the stick all the way to uh, <clears throat> to my gut. Uh, and not fear ORG. Oh, this is before the owl system. Owl system makes it unbelievably easy. Uh, so you just pull till you get the beeper and uh, slow rate beeper, then fast rate beeper. But but it does help uh, you, you learn the feel of it. Um, the uh, pitch uh, is a uh, determining factor too. If the nose is up, you're going to slow down faster. If the nose is down, you have a tighter turn radius and faster turn rate because of gravity is helping you uh, and you slow down uh, slower the uh, so so but below 350 uh, so I tried I tried to maneuver 385 that's what I tried to do and that's based on just to have a I mean just a little tickle just a little little bitty rumble uh, on my fingertips or a little rumble in the headset and then, uh, and, and just vibration on of the stick a little tickle on the fingertips <clears throat> and yet start adding more more back pressure to make your turn tighter uh, or generate a little more nose rate, then then the, the tickle will will become uh, almost like a uh, like a, you know quit choking me kind of uh, sensation on the stick, uh, and the the rumble that's that's in the airframe picks, starts to pick up a cadence, and that's because the the boundary layer, the airflow across the top of the wing, is starting to separate and slap the top of the wing, and so. So when you get down below 250, if you're really a hand fist or you just need to, to give up all your knots to generate a really hard defensive turn into a bandit, if you're willing, you, you know, like I said, you can suck the stick into your lap and not over G it. And you can do that and you can just cash in all your knots. And now you're down below 250 knots and essentially you're flying your plane as if you're in the traffic pattern, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Where you put the gear down and start planning your landing, so because because that's the type of airplane you're flying, uh, and and generally speaking, BFM fights will degenerate to where both airplanes are <clears throat> flying in that state. We'll do a, you know, we'll get into a to a circular fight, <clears throat> usually descending to maintain energy, and then we get to the floor, then we flatten it out so that we don't bust the floor, and now. You're, you're just, uh, you might as well be in the traffic pattern as far as the airplane performance. Neither one has an advantage on the other. <clears throat> and so, so below 250, if you, if you, you should never go below 250 unless you're defensive 
or unless you know that that this one last uh, pull of the nose will get you a shot, a kill shot, maybe a gunshot. Uh, if the bandage is as slow as you are, uh, and that generally is the case. Uh, you might get a fadeaway, what we call a fadeaway jump shot. Uh, if a bandage tries to get away, you know, the guy across the circle from you rolls out and you just keep bringing it around. Well, give up all those knots to get the nose on him. <clears throat> Super search the radar out there, grab him, uh, launch an AIM-9 if, uh, if you're still within range or toggle forward to an MRM and, and send, uh, you know, your big white wingman uh, out to get him. So, so those are the two times, either you're in a last ditch defensive maneuver or you, you know you've got to kill if you could just get your, bring your nose and your weapons to bear. So that, it's all on the fingertips as far as uh, having the airplane talk to you and tell you how you are flying it. Does the airplane, so you're talking, so you mentioned ours, which is the overload warning system. So, so that, was, that, that was part of the expansion of the G limit from 7.33 to 9, wasn't it, for the, That's for the true. Eagle? Um, does the airplane have any vices in terms of spiking G? I've read a few reports where somebody will try and go to 9G, but they'll spike through. And that's, you know, I understand a characteristic of, of the handling, well, hand, a handling characteristic of the aeroplane. Um, I've heard about auto roll, um, that kind of thing. Are there, are, there any, are there any parts of that story that you've just told us that you can get bitten? There, um, I, don't, I don't know. If, if, you, if you're paying attention to your speed, then, uh, then uh, well, let me, let me turn that around. If you're not paying attention to your speed, yes. You can give it a, a full deflection elevator authority pull and spike through nine Gs. Uh, so that's why, you know, especially about 420, uh, increasingly so from 385 to um, to uh, 420. But above 420, yes, you can you can over G the jet with a maximum deflection, minimum time uh, snatch, we call it, so to speak. Uh, so. Uh, so that's but but you have to be oblivious to your energy state to do that. Mm-hmm. You see that, or you have to be panicking, like uh, you just woke up from a G loss of consciousness episode, and you're staring at a, at a, a windscreen full of you know, ocean or or land. That's where most that's where many overages occur. Uh, I think you were uh, talking about roll coupling as far as uh, you mentioned the word couple, and there is that. Uh, and, and and that generally it is in a really tight uh, downward going spiral BFM, and you're attempting to use rudder to swing the nose in tighter, and then it will the the flight control system uh, thinks that uh, that you want to roll the airplane, and it will go into an uncommanded roll, and all you really want to do is just kick the nose into the middle of the turf. Uh, BFM is uh, it, it is like seventy five percent or eighty uh, percent. Well, let me put it this way: it's equal parts energy manual, which we just talked about, and lift vector control. Because where your lift vector coming out the top of the airplane is, I even have my handy dandy training aids this time. F fifteen. Mm-hmm. You probably know this, but these are known as fighting sticks. This is what this is the sort of thing we use to debrief um, in, you know, it, it's after the missions to demonstrate or to illustrate the actual maneuver being flown or that was flown, uh, and it had just done, done instruction as well. <clears throat> but the 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 secret to BFM as well as energy management is knowing where your lift vector is pointing because that's where your nose is going. So you want to get your lift vector, even though your nose may be in lag of the target, you want to get your lift vector out in front of them. So you pull the nose, and it may it may require you going dipping the nose down and underneath to 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 because adding God's G, you're increasing your arm rate going downhill, and then get the nose underneath the target, and then pull up, pull the nose up in front of the target. Now you're pulling lead. So that you can slack off the G, maintain your energy as the as the bandit approaches the gun side, approaches the the pipper, 
<clears throat> or this uh, uh, gets uh, into the SRM, the heat seeker, uh, seeker circle. So you can uncage the AIM-9 and send the AIM-9 on its way. So, uh, so knowing where your lift vector is and where it's, well, where, which way it's pointing is crucial in Vietnam because it tells you, where it tells the airplane where to go to the nose of the airplane. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a, a, a roll coupling uh, phenomenon, but uh, you have to really be uh, kicking the rudder pedals left and right, I, I think, or you have, you know pushing the inside rudder to the stop to try to get to wrap around it. It'll wrap around and it will come unwrapped. <laughs> That's the problem. You get in it and it's hard to get out of it, especially if you're you know, nose down, uh, headed for the dirt. Yeah. Because now you have to just forget everything and control the airplane yeah. and get it out of the dive. Anyway, so those 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 two things might be uh, noteworthy as far as, uh, uh, what did you call them? Not flaws, but... Uh, vices or, yeah, things like that. Yeah, vices. Them. Yeah. Did, so they so might you, be, but they're, 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 they're very mild. I mean, in other words, if, you, if you're paying attention to your energy level, and you're paying attention to your lift vector, then those generally will not happen. So, so this may be, therefore, a redundant question, but you've talked about 300, 385 knots true being your number to for corner velocity. You've talked about the boundary layer air separating and creating this cadence of, of sort of thumping on the wing. So right. you've got these indications. One thing you haven't mentioned is angle of attack. Do you not need to think about angle of attack if you're if you're monitoring those two other things? Um, you know, was there yeah, I mean, an AOA that, figure that you would use to say this is the optimal term for a no, sustained? Not term? for me, right? Because uh, for me, my eyes were always on the target or looking for targets or looking for people that thought I was their target. Um, I was the uh, the um, the tactile sense on the stick is your AOA indication. If it's just, if it's that feather light, little tremble, little nibble, um, then then you're you're right on the max, L, the L over D max curve. Um, then, then if the airframe, sensations from the airframe outweigh what you're getting on the stick, you're slow. Uh, at, at 250 knots, if you're still demanding full ass stick trying to get the nose to go somewhere, or trying to defend against a, a bad guy, then at 250 knots, the the, the boundary layer separation and the the cadence, the frequency of the of um, the the um, buffet, it's it's like an elephant stomping on your wings. It's it's very uh, very loud, gets your attention, and it's and it's relatively slow. Boom, 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 boom. So. If, if you're if you're if you're in full out stick uh, with the airplane uh, sounding like you're in, in the middle of the, the three ring circus full of elephants, then then yeah you you need to be getting out of there as quickly as you can. So, For a follow up then on this this question of the um, the roll coupling and using the rudder pedals um, well to actuate the rudders um, in order to get a turn or to, or to slice inside. Um, so the F-15 has the control augmentation stability system, the CAS, that's run by the stick force sensor at the bottom of the grip. When you, when we talked last time about Tomcats, it might actually be in this episode, I'm losing track of which conversations happen when and when I'm releasing them, but when we talked about the Tomcat, you talked about that being the sort of great airspeed indicator in the sky with the wings sweeping forwards. Right. Uh, one of the things that Tomcat guys are renowned for is sort of cheating, pulling circuit breakers to allow them to deploy more flat than they're supposed to be able to, um, you know, tricking guys into thinking that the wings coming forward because they're slow and all that kind of stuff so you know tricky dicky uh, type tactics um did you do the same then with the eagle could you turn the cast off would you ever want to turn the cast off to get more uh, you know more more uh, your rate as opposed to you hitting the rudders and then the airplane thinking you want roll and creating roll for you what what did, did was there any anything like that that went on the eagle well the the quickest short answer is no but let me go back to what you were saying about the uh, um, tom kitty drivers uh, uh, Tomcat drivers, uh, uh, well, let me just put it this way. In air-to-air -air combat, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. You're not trying hard enough. So, yeah, we 
we do things uh, that anything that will give us an edge, especially in dissimilar combat training. Uh, anything in, that'll give us an edge in real air to air combat. So don't blame for doing that. As far as uh, tricks of the eagle, no. The controlling the cast, the the, the uh, step grip pressure sensor mounted immediately b below the stick and above the, uh, the, uh, the immediately below the stick grip, but above the stick itself, uh, that pressure sensor, uh, that is an electronic overlay over the hydromechanical linkage. Uh, the stick itself is just a regular old, I mean, it didn't have that. And by the way, that transducer and its circuitry and its, uh, and, and what little uh, computer power it had in it, that was the basis of the fly-by-wire system for the F-16. Mm. So, so that 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 unit, plug it into the right side console of a F-16 and just wire um, the the hydraulic uh, actuators rather than, uh, rather than have them be actu actuated by you know rods and and you know, cables and pulleys or yeah. or uh, push pull rods. That's all that is. Wow, so. Yeah. So what that does is it it it, it adds a, a sense of finesse. And for instance, when when you go to, if you're if you're trying to really rack it around into a hard slice downhill right hand turn to 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 get in behind a bandit uh, and get a shot off before you can get away like a fox that or a flock or somebody that can really flee, then then you don't want anything but what the cast can give you because. You pull the stick to the to the rear right hand corner, and you'll see the two stabilators go like this behind you. If you have your mirrors, but if you're so up as to put your mirrors on your stabilators rather than <laughs> on your high six o'clock, <laughs> but that's what you'll see. You'll see it is and it's like a, they they form a corkscrew. They will rotate the airplane even if the ailerons are are um, in trend flight. That's how powerful those big stabilators are. So, so no, I don't want to kick off the cast and get more out of it because I can only screw it up. Yeah. I can only screw it up. Um, now, I can add more rudder, but I'm not going to change uh, what I do with the stick, and I'm not going to pull the cast to, because the rudders are not really hooked up to the cast system. Okay. I mean, there's no pressure sensors to tell the airplane how much rudder you're adding. And that's why that roll coupling was, was a problem, is that you're adding something that the cast doesn't even recognize, doesn't even know what you're doing. You know, the, you do that and the cast goes, oh, WTFO, dude. Uh, so, uh, and it'll give you it'll give you what your stick is commanding, but it had, anyway, that's, that's the source of the roll coupling problem. Okay. Um, it's best to avoid it unless you, like I said, you needed that for that last little bit, but don't over control it. it yeah. What, what about what about other um, things that you might want to avoid, or other parts of the envelope you might want to avoid? Could you tail slide? Can you split the throttles? You talked about you you can't overdo the airplane if you, if you're paying attention to your energy state, or it's difficult to let's say. Um, you know, but but is it possible for you to be in a fight with somebody, a BFM fight where they're taking uphill? And you're so engrossed oh, yeah. with it that you actually lose track of your energy state, and you do end up stalling in a vertical, um, you know, sort of near near vertical. Yes. Yeah. If, if it, well, and going back to the one B two, um, the the place that I can recall doing just what you said is in is in a one B two situation, and I want one of them to lose sight of me, so I will climb into the sun until I run out of knots. Because with you know two F one hundreds pushing me you know towards the moon, uh, that I can go up a long ways. Stay out of the A nine envelope. It, and furthermore, if they do get their nose on me or get the uh, radar to slew an A nine or the Soviet equivalent, guess what? It's looking into the sun. Hmm. It's not gonna come get me. It's going to get the hottest spot in the sky, and that's and that's uh, the sun. So, so yeah, that's the time when I would run, just run up into the sun, and let it fall. Uh, 
but that, those are rare occasions. And as I said, they're usually 1v2. One of the one of the things I was going to mention about 1v2 from our previous um, time together is that the key to survival in 1v2 is, number one, of course, keeping track of both the adversaries, right? Because it's the guy that you don't see that's going to kill you. So the trick is to keep them both on the same side of the airplane. And usually you want to, to use your lift vector, pull your nose to aft of the second, if they're in any kind of formation, aft of the second adversary. So they're both parked on the same side of you. They're both on your canopy side. If you're in a turn, if you're, if you're having to do a uh, uh, maneuver such as we just talked about, about going into a tail slide, that way they, you camp them both behind you. Mm -hmm. And then with that flip at the top, now they're both in front of you. And then you want to threaten the first guy, but then as soon as you get close enough to where you know he can't maneuver against you, you want you want to threaten you want to threaten him literally with a midair. You want to make him flinch. And and then you go to the second guy immediately. And then you blow by him, check thirty degrees away from both of them, and again park them at your six o'clock as you're running for the roses. So that that's uh that's a an additional 1v2 maneuvering thing that, uh, that, that I previously wanted to mention. Keep, well, keep both adversaries on the same side of, of your airplane. Well, this maybe then is an obvious point for you to talk to us about 2v1 then. I mean, is there anything else about Max performing the airplane, flying the airplane? No, well, I just wanted to, uh, just wanted to share about the, the tickling, yeah. the sensation, the tactile sense on the finger chips. Um, normally we would, uh, um, we always wanted to engage at least at 480, uh, true, uh, which would be somewhere in, uh, yeah, up around 500 indicated. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, you can start maneuvering really at 420, uh, and not have a gargantuan turn radius. Uh, even, even high G, you're just going so fast. The turn radius is huge. So you want to you want to get that you want to slow down to towards cornering velocity, but but if you're doing it, the other thing I was going to mention is at four if you've used island boards when you're at four twenty every the boards come in and the throttles go to the wall because you're going to need every ounce of uh, of energy those those Pratt and Whitney's are producing, and what you don't need you use to to go into the vertical and retain the high ground, retain the top of the egg where the turn radius is smaller. Um, so, but anyway, so, so those are, those are the three numbers that I use, uh, 480, 420, 385, and then max performance as far as just pure aerodynamic performance is around 350, but below 350, your, your nose is slowing down and your turn radius is getting wider because you're, you're, you have less knots, therefore less lift to turn the nose. Hmm. So anyway, that's all I was going to, uh, kind of sum up with was a kind of a airspeed regime to uh, to look at no that's good yeah it's very insightful so so if if the objective in a 1v2 is to keep them both on the same side presumably your objective in the 2v1 is to is to split the the objective of a 2v1 uh, is to and splitting is the is very helpful uh, is to kill the the single bandit as quickly as possible. Uh, there's two things that will attract the eyeballs of an adversary that's just just uh, uh, trolling around clueless, looking for a fight, looking for somebody to shoot. The two things are a fireball in the sky because you don't see that every day. So when it shows up, it's like, ah, they're over there, right? Mm. The other thing is an F-15 in plan form. You know, the... Uh, So, so here, here's an F-15 coming at you, making itself as small as it can be, right? Here, here's an F-15 going sideways. You'll notice a big difference when we turn it up on the It's Yeah, it's not called uh, the flying tennis court for nothing. There's lots of wing area there, and that's what gives it this great left and, and turning performance. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, so as soon as the bad guy blows up, then both of you need to be getting out of dodge uh and the trick then is to 
make that the bad guy blow up as soon as possible hmm. uh, before the rest of his uh, his friends can show up. Uh, so so and that's done as you mentioned by splitting uh, the pincer. The uh, remember we talked about radar intercept and then the visual within visual range the, the BBR to BFM uh, phases of engagement <clears throat> in the BBR then you come in together as a two ship and if it's, if you know you have a single bogey single target out there then then you split uh, if he's an aware bandit or he's got GCI um, then he will be informed uh, that that's what's happening uh, at, and he will either have to turn around and leave, which, you know, air to air, you've done your job, you've cleared the airspace of the adversary, or he will attempt to take one or the other of you. Uh, and that will give what we call turning room to the, to the, uh, to the other member of the formation. Um, once you're in the visual room, the same as a fly. Let's, let's say that, uh, you, you mort, uh, that is to kill, you mort one at the merge. <clears throat> and now it's 2v1 against the remaining bandit. And so, yes, uh, you want to, through comm, as, as you pointed out in our, one of our last sessions, the airplane back in the day when, before Data Lake was very comms dependent. So, so as, soon as, uh, as soon as one uh, of the two adversaries, if you were going two against two, blew up, then it was incumbent to, to get the guy who killed him his eyeballs on the other guy, especially if that fight wasn't going so well. And in fact, we'll see in this in this video during the, the second engagement of the HUD part of the second engagement, um, they had to do that. They had the they they boarded one of the phantoms uh, near the merge or shortly after the merge. But then when that when that guy called after he called the kill, then he had to get his wingman to call his eyes onto the onto the, the bandit that he was moving. And that fight wasn't going so well. In other words, it, it wasn't over as quickly as the first, as leader's fight. So get get his eyeballs and then call the call the uh, engaged fighter off so that the free fighter this, can come in because he's got a lot more energy. He's got everything out in front of him, so he's got total situational awareness as much as you can. And so he can take a plus uh, switching uh, from one to the other means, especially if the adversary doesn't know it, means that he's predictable, either defending it against one of you or trying to get at one of you. So he's he he's got his eyes on on the wingman when the leader has got all kinds of options to get in and employ organs. So yeah, you work, you do uh, want to uh, to split uh, because uh, as we we just discussed. That, that makes him have to split his attention. And unless he's aware enough to try to keep both of you on the same side of his cockpit, same side of his canopy, then uh, then he's eventually going to lose one of you. Hmm. And, and by switching back and forth, you can beat him down on energy. And, and then it's like clubbing baby seals. I was going to ask that. You, yeah. you said it, so you answered it already. It was, it was like clubbing baby seals. Yeah, because he's helpless. If, if, if he's running all out of energy and you have two, there's two of you, then one of, one of you is going to get to take the home to kill. Yeah. You're going to get the scout. And what, what, um, so, so a 2v, um, a 2v1 like that, you would expect it to start beyond visual range. So you're starting with a radar picture initially before you, you pick up a visual. Are there, um, you talked in the first part of this episode about the third phase being to disengage from the fight on your own terms. For, for, for an aware bandit against then two F-15s, what would an uh, engage, disengaging from the fight on their own terms look like? Can they just go into the beam and do something funky like go into the vertical or, or you know, do something to make you guys go back down to the looking in the radar and scanning volumes of sky to find them? Is there an obvious way yeah. to just not, not get involved, not get tangled up? That, that's true. If um, the best defense against two eagles is by a single uh, band, a single target, is to get in the beam to have the radars break lock, if, if that's possible. Because those notches, we call them, those blind areas, they're they're not as big as uh, as we often talk about them. And furthermore, 
as the geometry changes, as the eagles approach, the geometry changes, and the the, the bad guy, if he's if he's staying in the beam by just maintaining the heading, he's going to come out of the beam in terms of relative bearing. Mm. So now you'll get a, a, a he'll show up because you're off of his tail, you're in his your quarter rather than his beam quarter. If you divide up the you know the target uh, by in ninety degree sections, ninety degree quarter. So, so it is, unless you have a really, really good GCI or AWACS, it is really difficult to keep the Eagles on your beam the whole time. Hmm. And in fact, in some cases, uh, depending upon the range, then uh, the power of the F-15's radar, now I'm talking shorter ranges, can power its way through the notch and, and get in there and find, get a radar return that is not the ground. And that's the, that's the definition of a notch, is that, is that the, the target attempts to have the same closure rate with the, uh, with the eagle as the eagle is crossing the ground, because that's, that's how the radar works. It, it has a filter that eliminates the, the, the motion of the ground uh, so that it can see targets coming at us or targets going away in a look-down mode. So, if, so if, you can, if you can maintain the same 90 degree out, orientation to the eagle you're moving at the same rate as the ground is below you as far as his relative motion then that's the place to hide but in the short range i would say five miles inside five miles the radar if, if the radar is looking down uh at the proper angle to actually put radar energy on the top of that airplane then it will be reflected there'll be enough re reflection to distinguish it from the ground clutter hmm. yeah going, going back to your um, sort of your debriefing stick and you showing the plan form of the eagle um, the number I always get told is is 10 miles is where it's where you're likely in plan form to get spotted in the eagle as far away as 10 miles I mean it is huge as you say um, did that's that, the rule we use so, so yes. what, what does that then the other thing is wing flashes presumably are a giveaway as well so people will, will sort of react to the sun glinting off of a wing if you if you roll or turn or whatever but so, so did that then from a well, from all phases of flight, did that restrict your maneuvering um, within that sort of ten mile range where you're not going to, you know, do no. certain things? No, uh, not for me personally. It might, it might have dampened some people's uh, the, the quote wing flash. Uh, you know, let's uh, dismiss with that. Uh, it's usually a canopy flash, not a wing flash. Mm. It's usually the sun reflecting off the canopy because the uh, the, the the paint scheme on on eagles that gray that the innocuous gray it, it has negligible reflective characteristics so 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 it's, so it's uh the flash of the canopy as the airplane's rolling but that is only momentary hmm. as soon as the roll is complete he disappears hmm. so you know he's over there somewhere but and you probably can guess which way he's going uh, left or right, or maybe even up and down. Uh, but we, it's only one dot in space. You have to have another dot, uh, you know, to start collect, drawing a line and anticipating where he's going to come within real visual range. Yeah. So I, I did not let that inside 10 miles, we would go what we call pure pursuit, point at the target, or we would be already deployed in our pincer, one of the two things. And that didn't matter if you were two ship. Doing a do a, a tactical split, or if you were a four ship, do it element splits. Mm -hmm. We would do that prior to ten miles because we wanted to be, you know, edge on mm -hmm. uh, visually until it was time to come in to the fight. Well, now you're giving all sorts of plan form, and two of you at the same time. Uh, so uh, so so uh, if it's an aware bandit, uh, he'll he, you know he's got either a good a good uh, GCI slash AOX, or he's got a really good visual search, then yeah, he'll pick you up. Hmm. But his disadvantage is while you have a lot of angles to get rid of to point at him, he does too. Because you're both, you know, you're both about 30 degrees offset to each other. And so what's, if you can get uh, pure pursuit on him, especially if you can get some altitude differentiation between both of you, then depending upon who he takes, because the split works vertically as well as it works horizontally. 
mm-hmm. depending upon which one of you two he takes or or the their two ship takes because uh many nations still fly uh you know pair patrol two airplanes in relatively close like a show formation as opposed to wide tactical slips so so they frequently will fight as really as a singleton you know as a single entity so so by splitting vertically then uh to see which one of you thereafter, that guy that goes defensive, the other guy has an end, as an entry. That's so. I think I already know the answer to the question, but it, but you talking about the vertical and you talking about the um, Doppler notch and the ability to filter out the ground returns and pick out the true target just made me think a little bit about uh, one of the Desert Storm Mig killers talking about um, when, when I interviewed him. He, talk, he took the yeah. shot. He was high and fast. To get the range out on the aim seven and then he said he took it down he said he went down because he wanted to get into the ground clutter i think it must have been someone shooting engaging one of the mig 29s i don't think they would have worried too much about the mig 23s but and so one of those guys I don't remember, I can't, so i don't know if it's jb kelk i can't remember who it was but yeah. um anyway um and so and and the question i have is how do you so in relation to that then so he he went down into the ground cluster so he was then effectively adopting a defensive posture or or protecting himself from being engaged by the mig 29 in return he's already got missiles in the air how, how do you balance flying to your strengths versus protecting against the strengths of the opponent or the or exploiting the weaknesses of the opponent so when you talk about a vertical split you know when we talked about the bear intercepts you said that you would never get in front of anything um in case it shot you down so you obviously don't want to take too many risks but would you that's very embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> get shot down by a barber that's very embarrassing and and, I, and now i'm thinking that bit's going to come after this bit so the audience is going to be like what are these guys talking about that will come later stay tuned we're talking about this guy talking about engaging bears and badgers um i'm not engaging them intercepting them um that'd be different so, but but do you would you disadvantage yourself by going low um, in order to stay in the ground clutter if you were flying against the MiG twenty nine or a, or a Su twenty seven, let's say, to create problems for them? Or are you always just going to play to your strengths and say we're going to go high and fast because we're going to use our capabilities and we're better than you are? Uh, yes, I would always play to my strengths because I believe my strengths with uh, our training and our discipline and our comms are. Situational errors give, given to us by AWACS uh, outweighs the the fear, if you will, uh, that he could see me. Uh, they, uh, I would much rather, as opposed to going low. Uh, and you got to remember, there's a start time. Um, we had a, uh, I think we had an inordinate uh, amount of uh, concern about the about the fulcrum and his look down, shoot down capabilities. Uh, turned out to not be uh, very clever at all. But uh, but at that time, we did not know. So everybody was was uh, being cautious. But I would rather, uh, if I have a missile in the air, I would rather support it at a maximum F-pole. Uh, that's the term for turning your nose away from the enemy as much as you can, but still keep the radar looking at him to guide the missile and waiting for it to time out. <clears throat> Rather than go low, you're not going to go to a notch because to, to maintain the radar lock, you can't get more than 60 degrees off, right? Mm. Uh, so you're not never going to get to a notch. Uh, so I would not, uh, I, that to me is not a viable alternative to stay high, maintaining your energy, uh, uh, and having all kinds of options open to you, such as going down when you need to, mm. if you do, uh, rather than being down low already, having eliminated uh, the vertical you know, b- you know, below you. So I, I'd, I'd rather stay with my strengths. And uh, and uh, I think uh, knowing the, again, remember our discussion on uh, BBR, the range of the radars relative you know, to the adversary, the range of the missiles relative to the, if I can get a missile in the air and hopefully two of them, um, before he can get one in the air to force me, I have a distinct advantage because he's, he, he's actually got three people coming after him, two little stupid missiles and me, which mm. is, I'm also stupid, but the three of us, we should combine forces to make up the difference. 
So, uh, and, and if I can slow down by turning away uh, to F pole, say 45 degrees for a 60 degree uh, radar angle, then then all of all of the closures, his cl not not all, more than 50 percent of the closure is his closure, which means that the missiles are going straight to him. So they will get to him before he can get to me. If that makes sense. Yeah. Can I, can I can I go down a bit of a rabbit warren with you on this at this sure. point? Um, and I think you might have had an aside about two v one or one v two um, that you wanted to, to share. But but my, so this is this really is a rabbit warren. When, okay. When um, in the Balkans, so it was the knife flight. I think nineteen ninety four. Jeff Wang was the guy. Lake and Heath went out. Uh, got. Um, Two Amram kills against two Meg twenty nines, I think it was, and he had he was using dual dual target track mode with the radar, where the radar could support um, was was just locking onto two targets. For anybody who's not familiar with that, locking onto two targets exclusively, time sharing as you described it, time share between them, that's between right. The two. And and infamously, um, he wrote an email about his engagement afterwards, which ended up on the internet, um, which is probably why he never gives any interviews now. He's he's learned his lesson, but but he in that he said I wasn't he was and he was a weapons school grad, and he so I'm thinking the reason I'm asking this is because you made me think about the shot the shoot look shoot doctrine or um, shot a technique or whatever it is that you call it that you did so you'd shoot one see if it's guiding or whatever and then turn back in and shoot another one but he said he wasn't supposed to use dual target track and he would have got hammered by the, his weapon schools instructors when when they found out that he had done that instead of going to presumably single target track and shooting one at a time why is that why why would you develop a technology a capability for the f-15 and then say you can't use it you know was it was it because G dtt was just not very po performant it wasn't very reliable what what, what is behind that I, I think at that stage steve it was a lack of trust you know if when you're pitting yourself and and it not it that intercepts you're one be everybody you know it's it's mutual it's mutual support by presence it, it yeah it's just another airplane over there in the dark now that we have data link, that you know, that's much, it's a much tighter use mutual support now. Of course, but this is pre-data link. Uh, so if you have two adversaries, uh, both of them what we call face shooters, uh, in in the dark, meaning you're not going to do a lot of uh, defensive maneuvering against you know their missile uh, or missiles. So uh, so the uh, you you want to get rid of one if not both of them. Well getting rid of one when there's two of them, that only evens your odds. And meanwhile, the other guy, the second guy, is looking at you, right? Mm -hmm. So if so I I wouldn't hesitate to take a chance on dual target track uh to put missiles on both those targets. Mm -hmm. Uh because you know they may not even know the missiles are coming and that's fine. But if they both blow up before their missile gets to me and I know that they're the type of airplane that requires their radars to be locked on to be for the missile to guide. If I, the best way of breaking an, <laughs> breaking a radar lock, an adversary's radar lock, is for the target to blow up. <laughs> the, the problem has gone away in a fireball. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's probably because uh, the lack of trust of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's but as I might have mentioned in one of our previous chats, there is this little known codicil of the fighter pilots' right for selective non-compliance. If I think that this this is what I need to do to make it work, then that's that's what I'm going to do. Hmm. Uh, was he a weapons school grad when he got those kills? Yeah. Well, then he knew. Come on, he knew. Whatever the weapons school guidance was, that's for the average eagle driver. That that's not for guys who are patch wearers. Uh, that's not for guys that are. I won't say it's not for guys that are on their second or third tour. But come on, if if a guy's been in the, in the eagle two or three years long, if he's been in the eagle for six years to nine years, he knows he knows how to work that airplane, mm -hmm. the weapon system, and make it and make it the best for him. But really, that really uh, to go back to the the scenario, it's really a one bx. You're one one against many when it's in the dark. There mm -hmm. were before Dalloway. So now I don't blame it at all, and I applaud him. It's good work, man. Good work. Yeah. Well, it, well, it was a, it was a, a bit of a, a warrant. So thank you for 
um, yeah, thanks for clearing that up. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I think you might be getting chastised maybe by the fighter weapons school or fighter weapons community because they don't want the average Eagle driver thinking you can do that and get away with it. Only mm -hmm. if you are very well experienced or very well trained, you know, top gun type training, mm -hmm. uh, fighter weapons school training, can, can you afford to try to be doing things like that? I mean, you should try it in practice and training. Uh, but when push comes to shove, 2v1, yeah, uh, especially with AMRAMs, it, uh, it's, uh, it's also a launch of the lead missile, right? Mm -hmm. Launch, F-pole, uh, to, to slow down their intercept on you. And as soon as it goes active, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Because... <laughs> I say hello to my really smart little wingman. <laughs> okay, okay, let's let's just keep this uh, rabbit warren going then, just for a bit, for a bit longer. Then, so tell me about weapon school guys and your experience of them. I mean, these days I talk to active duty guys, um, uh, well, current guys, so it's guys who are still flying the airplane, and and I I hear mixed things about weapon school graduates. I I you know. You, you get the idea from talking to them that they, you know, they're they're these sort of gods of the sky, and maybe some of them are. And um, and I've been fortunate enough to know and and interview a few of them. You know, people like Parker Geisler and you know th those oh, sorts yeah. of individuals. But um, who clearly is a god of the sky. But but did are there, were there, was there really such a gulf between a weapon school graduate and um, an experienced captain? Or, or a, you know, a young major who who had spent six to nine years in the jet already. Uh, uh, were, were, were they really these sort of omnipotent? The, om, well, the know. Gulf is narrowed by by experience, of course. Uh, any uh, any captain on his on his second or third tour uh, will probably be because because they'll be its squadron instructors by that by that time. You know, uh, usually if you had. Oh, 350, 500 hours of Eagle time. If you weren't all, if you weren't an instructor, then guess what? You were not getting another Eagle tour mm -hmm. because you you just didn't you just hadn't cut it, so to speak, right? Uh, so uh, so everyone was striving to become an instructor, and and of course that's the that's the next rung up above above your line fighter pilot towards becoming a fighter weapons school instructor because fighter weapons school only takes F-15 instructors, but then they instruct them specifically in the weapons and the tactics. Uh, so, and you know, and the airplanes abilities, all that. And they do very, very demanding, uh, you know, flight, uh, uh, training, uh, performance, uh, check rides, very demanding, more more so than the, the just the line, mission ready check ride. So uh, so when I was uh, in, in Eagles uh, up until two thousand, the fighter weapons school grads uh, had the well deserved uh, reputation of being gods of the eagle. Uh, however, from what I understand. Uh, <clears throat> By the by, the time we had drawn down after the after the the Cold War, after the close of the Cold War, then that also became a a criteria for becoming a squadron commander. It started as a criteria for becoming a wing commander, and then it mm -hmm. filtered down through becoming an OG commander and then squadron commander. Because to become a OG or or a wing commander, you had to have been a squadron commander. So, whereas before there were some some weapon school grads who were they were great tactical instructors, but and we would follow them into a fight and we would follow them to the bar anytime. But the Air Force leadership goes, "Nah, I don't want, I don't want that guy. He's too aggressive. I, I don't want him in charge of of uh, twenty four airplanes and and thirty fighter pilots, right?" Because there's, you got to be able to control your aggressiveness. You have to be able to think about about your people rather than just about the mission. Because fire weapons school, uh, it's mission, mission, mission when it comes to air to air, and I think it is in all types of tactical employment. But uh, but but when you start making wearing a fire weapons school patch, 
a criteria for becoming a squadron commander and ultimately a wing commander. Now you're starting to add the politics to it. And as I might have mentioned in one of our mm-hmm. earlier segments, that that really does uh, dilute the uh, p- the tactical proficiency and the tactical potential of the fighter force is to have your units led by politicians instead of people who are really dedicated to accomplishing the mission, getting in there, you know, kicking ass and taking names, blowing shit up and killing people and and coming home alive. Hmm. You know, if you're not totally focused on that, I really don't want to go into battle with you. Hmm. If you're just a politician who's, you know, just getting your ticket punched so that you can move up a, into the brigadier general's uh, ranks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, boss. I'll do what you want to do, but don't expect a lot of uh, a lot of support when it's over. Kind of thing. So, so I think it's become that because we we trimmed down the force so much that we made that a selection criteria because they are the cream of the cream, right? Hmm. At least that was our previous reputation. I I do believe that for the most part they still are. Yeah. So, it's, and it's so, just so, so don't, so don't take my yeah. Don't, I'm sorry, but don't take my words to mean that if you see a weak commander, or brigadier general, or someone in a very high leadership position wearing a Fighter Weapons School graduate patch, don't think that that's a bad thing, hmm. that that he's not a good good fighter pilot. Uh, I'm just saying that it had a tendency, I believe, uh, what I noticed as, as I was approaching my re- retirement, it had a tendency to to have us elevate, uh, because it, it just helped, it made it easier for the Air Force. Now we only have to look at this set of names and not everybody. If you follow me, it makes yeah. their, their yeah. selection choices uh, easier. So anyway, so but please don't take that the wrong way to say that just because they're wearing a fighter weapons school patch means that they're they're not as good as they should be. I don't know. It's all individual. Yeah. As you yeah, know. and and my question is really based on anecdotal. You know, talking to you know you know, 10, 15 people over the last couple of years have said we had a weapons school officer in our squadron who was useless, you know, so so it's not like it's it's um, endemic. It's just a couple of, you know, a couple of examples it, it, where... And, yeah, you know, and it may very well be, may very well be uh, more true today than it was in 2000 when yeah. I got, when I retired. Uh, I suspect that it is just knowing the Air Force hmm. from 26 years in service, you kind of get a feel for how this institution, what it's... Uh, what its value and its track record really is. Um, anyway, enough, enough about not flying airplanes. <laughs> Let's talk about you. Um, so, so what's um? Did you have an anecdote? Did you have an aside about? Was it one v two or two v one? We we were talking. Yeah, I had a, actually I've got a story about that. It, it, yeah, I have a quick. Uh, a, a, well, you know me. None of my stories are quick. Okay, I, I have I have one. I think to be a short story about. Going one B two, that single ship F fifteen against two adversaries, uh, and, it, and it illustrates the uh, the two two points. Uh, one point is is uh, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, and the second point is if you're going one B two, keep them both on the same side of the airplane, and if you can't get a kill, get away, right. So, because once you get a kill, you, now you're one v one. Most self-respecting fighter pilots will pit their own skills against any single adversary until proven otherwise. You know, like my skills maybe not be as good as yours. So, so took off from Bitburg, uh, flight lead of five and two versus two F sixteens out of Han. Two v two, two v two, air to air. So these vipers come up, uh, and my wingman, uh, I can't remember where he had to abort, whether it was on, it, it, we were airborne, so I, I remember that. So he had to go back, he had to return to base for some problem. <clears throat> it did not require me to accompany him, so I, w- I went to the area. So, roll over to, uh, to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, tr- the tra frequency, uh, TRA, that's, uh, I think that's Temporary Reserved Airspace. Uh, in the U.S., they're called MOAs. Um, in Germany, they were TRAs. 
And that's, that was the airspace uh, set aside for military uh, training flights. <clears throat> so I, we're on a straw basket or a sweet apple control, one of the, one of the uh, four ATAF uh, GCI sites. <clears throat> and so since I knew I had two of them and I knew I only had one of me, then I put my aux radio on, on the fight frequency, on the check-in frequency. And, and of course, the, on the microphone, it, it, uh, you can roll, roll it forward to, for the main comm, number one, and back for the, uh, for the aux. So, uh, so when I, so when I rolled over to the, to the frequencies, I just pushed the mic forward and go, disco flight, check in, two. In other words, I pushed the mic to the back and using the secondary radio, checked in as my wingman. Straw basket, disco flight, flight of two, ready to play, try 206. <clears throat> Roger, that uh, bandits are, uh, are uh, 150 uh, 30 miles. Well, the Vipers had to listen on the aux, on their aux frequency <clears throat> uh, uh, for our GCI so that we could communicate the, the knock it offs, five sound knock it off. <clears throat> and so I, so I called ready to play in the, uh, in the North, they, they called ready to play. And so as, as I was working the radar, I would, I would give out disco zero one contact bearing one five zero 30 miles low to say to disco zero one showing an echelon breakout, uh, East, uh, to negative single contact. So, so I, I gave I gave this false radio chatter, <laughs> and arrived at the merge with them thinking there were two of us, and so and so that one of them went into a last ditch because uh, I called Fox One. Yeah. I even called I probably called a Fox One from Two as well, <laughs> uh, and uh, but but because the Vipers didn't have any in a uh, radar missile capability that was just aim nice back then, that we, we had agreed that we would not be caught Fox 1 kills, but that they would defend against the Fox 1 as if it was a Soviet radar missile. So uh, so so we get, get to the merge, and one of them goes into a 9G back turn, you know, to defend against the missile, right? And I hear, I, I hear him say, okay, I'm awake now, where is he? <laughs> Because he had, he had basically passed out in his ninth Jeep defensive turn, right? So I'm up above. I, I see him roll underneath me. And now it's a point of, as I said before, uh, keeping them both on the same side. Their problem, of course, was they were looking for a second eagle. They had me in sight, but they were looking for my phantom wingman. So, uh, so I, was a, I was able to, uh, you know, to keep them both on the same side of me, pull to the, to the, the trailer, and... Take a snapshot because you'll never. I, I did not want to get into a BFM fight with that guy because then the other guy would, would have the advantage because I'm tied up. Take a snapshot on this guy, roll belly up to him, pull 40 to 60 degrees, unload, full blower down to the bottom of the truck, you know, bumping up against the mock and parking them behind me with their little A9s, unable to reach me. So, so that, that little story incorporates both the <laughs> If you're not cheating, you're not trying, and keep them both on the same side of you, and then leave when you still have an advantage. Did you did you do a second setup with them? Oh yeah. yeah. Did they they figured out though eventually that there was yeah. only one of you. Yeah, there was only one of you at the first. It's so, so of course at that time that I, I took my shots and I blew through. Yeah. Now. <laughs> so. Yep. Anyway. It is fun as well as work. <laughs> Tell us about then two v two. That's the obvious progression for the the conversation, I think. And and then because we've referenced it a couple of times, but we haven't actually explicitly stated it. We've got some um, from from YouTube. It's um, uh, a 1985 video with some. Uh, uh, well, it's called um, uh, VSD visual. Was it? V what does VSD even stand for? V v visual situational display. Now it's the radar screen. Vertical, vertical situation display. There you go. V the, the As VSD. opposed to a horizontal uh, situation display. 
Okay, so we've got some of that. Of it's, it's, situation indicator. And you're going to talk us through it. So, so we'll get to that after we've we've talked two v two. But, but so, so tell us then how does how does that differ, two v two from? Well, two v two is is really it's either two one v ones, uh, flown separately but in conjunction, or it's a two v one knowing the second bandit is out there. If the um, if if the, if they stay together, then it's a two v two. Uh, I'm sure your your um, you know folks that watch your your podcast. I'm sure they're well aware of uh, uh, how F-15s fly uh, a tactical formation, line of dress, an altitude stack, checking each other six uh, uh, as high and as fast as you can go without being uh, in the contrail levels, so you don't highlight yourself. Then we have the maximum amount of energy uh, to go downhill and engage the the baddest. Uh, then, if if it's a single target, as I mentioned earlier, we'll do a we'll do a split, and then the, the bad guys will come after one or the other, and then that gives the the uh, the one that's not favored by the bandits turning room to get in uh, with some advantage. Uh, if um, if they are if, if they're aware. Uh, uh, then of course you may want not want to sacrifice that mutual support, the visual mutual support, by doing a split because now you're one deep, whatever whatever is left after what after the first ball eight missiles. So uh, so typically we would take both airplanes and offset to the same side, uh, the most advantageous side. Uh, if it's uh, just a straight up coin toss, coin coin toss, then. Uh, then you'll take the up sun side. You want to come out of the sun. Uh, easier to see them, harder to, for them to see you, uh, more difficult for them to get a, a heat seeking missile uh, pointed your way uh, effectively. So uh, so the uh, the whole idea is to, is to do that and remain aware enough of their formation to where you both get missiles on individual targets and not and not both of you get a lot of missiles on one target. Let the other guy go free, because now he's a danger. Uh, so you want to be, and that's called the targeting plan. Uh, usually, if the two F-15s are in line of breast, which we typically were, if the bad guys are anything close to line of breast, we would take a side to side breakout. In other words, if I'm on the left, I take the left hand guy. If I'm on the right, I take the right hand guy. If it's a, uh, if they, if they. Uh, do something that might have been a trail formation where the first guy is bait usually because he, yeah, only a fool or an idiot, and they're both out there. We come into the merge straight, straight and level, allowing two eagles to pounce on him, right? So the reason they put a singleton or a single two ship out front is really to be the bait. They get to around 10 miles and then they go, in, they go to one side or the other to get in the notch or to just drag out of the fight, and hopefully you will follow them, leaving you to be the targets for the second pair, or the second one if it's just 2v2, two, 2 versus 2. So uh, so you, if it's uh, if they break out into a lead trail formation, uh, then the leader, if I'm the leader, I take their leader. If I'm number two, I take their number two. And then if they're at echelon, and you can't really tell if it's a lead trail formation, uh, or a um, uh, or a wingman kind of formation, that's side to side. Then you just talk about it. Uh, I've got the guy. I've got the guy on the left. Even if he's the leader or the trader, I've got the guy on the left, and then you confirm without it. I got the guy on the left at seventeen thousand. Roger. I got the trailer. Again, now we transition from side to side to lead trail. But just for clarity, I've got the trailer at at, at twelve thousand. Because he wants to have a look up shot, right? So, so okay. Now, then, the, then the flight lead has the responsibility to call out either sorted or basically break lock and try again. You know, we're cross locked. We're either you're on my target or or we're on each other's targets. So, uh, so if the if the uh, leader of the formation says sorted, then. Then now it's it's two one B ones in the BVR part of the uh, engagement, and, and you do whatever you need to do with your target 
to make sure that you get a missile to arrive uh, at his uh, destination before his missile can get to you. If if they have got you cross-locked, then now you may have to defend against one of the adversaries while you're uh, continuing your BVR engagement on the one that you have locked up. And there again, the comm will take will take that uh, take. I won't say it will take care of that because it never does. You, know, you can't kill them with words, but you can sort it out to where uh, where you're aware that okay, the you know I may be the wingman targeting their trailer, targeting their wingman, but their leader has me locked up and not my leader, hmm. right? And as soon as as if, if there's no sorting call, and I recognize that now, now I have to defend against the guy looking at me and shoot the guy that I'm engaging. So now I'm in a 1v2. So that's why the 1v2 training is helpful. I'm in a 1v2. My uh, flight lead, he's in a 1v1 against an unknown, against an unaware bandit because that bandit is looking at me. Yeah. So he has massive advantage over that one guy. But he has no idea where the second guy is because I got him locked up. He doesn't. Now, this is all, of course, pre-data link and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, <laughs> so you can see how 2v2 is either either two 1v1s or it's a 2v1 with the other bandit out of the fight. Or it's a 1v2 with your formation member uh, it engaged really on a tactical intercept because he's got all the advantages over that one target he's got. So so that's how I would like to classify uh, 2v2 engagements. Uh, once we get into the visual arena, then hopefully somebody's blowing up on their side <laughs> and making it a 2v1 for you. <laughs> yeah, but there but there is, as you'll see in the uh, in the video, there is uh, times when you're both fighting each other, but you're, you're both fighting both of them at the same time. And uh, that calls from some for some really fast uh, craning work uh, to call switches to where you switch bandits. If you, if either one of you gets a p position of advantage on the other bandit, uh, then give up your fight uh, rather than just going around in a swirl. Give up your fight. Go to that guy. Shoot him. And let your wingman shoot your bandit. Hmm. You know. So and that's a really a lot of heads up. Uh, uh, tactical awareness, situation awareness, tactical awareness, and tactical thinking. But I don't think we need to get into into all of those permutations. You you, you talked earlier about uh, not earlier in this conversation, but I think earlier in this episode about um, the fact that your you you know through flying and through the, the repetition, you kind of get to know what's happening when. When does your missile time out? When what? Where should they be? So you kind of. You know, through that experience, you learn that. Um, does you, the can same, yeah, you can anticipate it. Yeah, you can anticipate it. Does, does, does the same then apply to being able to figure out whether or not, you know, you're in that 1v2 where the flight lead is locked onto you, let's say, but you're locked onto the, the trailer and, and uh, you know, are there, are there obvious copper indications to tell you that that's happening? Does the raw tell you? He's locked to me. What about ambiguities? What, what if? Yeah. You know. What if? What if your wingman's war is roar is also going off? How, how does how does that work? That that only works. I would have to qualify with if the spatial relationship between the four airplanes is such that you can differentiate the 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 uh, the radar target that you are locked to versus the target that has you locked up. Hmm. In other words, if you know there's two of them out there. And you're not in dual target track or any other mode that gives you a, 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 a you know more targets on the screen than, than single target track. If you're in a single target track, uh, then you know the azimuth and range to your target. It, compare that with the RWR. Uh, if that if the target that that uh, that you have locked up is of the same bearing, and of course this RWR is not the range um, per se, is the signal strength, right? But but it, it's within reason. It's it's in the ballpark. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using it. So um, so if it looks like this, the, your the tar your target is the one locking you up, then it's it's a one v one, VBR. But if they've got a decent spread, or if they've got a decent uh, lead trail uh, 
uh, setup where one of them, say, took a 360 to follow in as the shooter while the first one was supposed to be the target, the dragger, the uh, the bait, if you will. Then, if you if if the guy that's got you locked up, if he is at the top of your scope on the RWR, but he's in the middle of your scope, so to speak, on your radar, then that's probably not the same guy. Or if the guy uh, that you have on your on your radar screen is because you're in the, the offset, uh, maybe he's 30 degrees to the left, but the guy that's locked you up is 60 degrees to the left, 30 degrees spread, because they're in a wide formation and you're out there, so the angles are different, then that's probably not the guy that, that you got locked up. So so it takes that kind of uh, relative uh, or spatial relationship to spread out for the two systems to be usable together to to you know to convince you that okay th this is my guy or this is the other bandit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, so talking, let me just get myself back here. Uh, so talking then about this sort of, I think you guys call them rope dope type tactics. Is that what you call them? Where you know sort of they'll send one out in front or two out in front, try and get you to commit to a fight and then drag you off and you get pounced on by someone else. Yeah. That sort of uh, Soviet uh, type tactic. And and again, having had the privilege of interviewing a bunch of Desert Storm mid killers, you know, they talk about right. being aware of those tactics. And and of course, you know, the um, the Air Force and the US military in, in general, as you talked about the um, was it the Tempelhof Tower where, you know, you guys were watching what these Germans right. are doing. So you guys knew all this stuff. But in a very long winded way, what I'm asking is were you aware of any good tactics? <laughs> were you training against any good tactics that the bad guys could use? Um, were you, you know, was it all that kind of very basic, quite predictable type stuff, or were there indications to you that actually sure. some? Because because it's tempting to say, well, they're all, you know, somebody once characterized the MiG twenty one to me as as an aeroplane. I think it was Parker Geisler who said to me, it's an aeroplane that you can take a guy one day is plowing a field with a water buff buffalo. And next day, yeah. they put him in the cockpit, and he can fly and and and, and operate it as a weapon system. Um, and so it's tempting to kind of think about that, isn't it, as threat threat nations, as being simpletons and not not having sophistication. But that patently yeah. isn't true. So th there must have been somebody that you were training for, a threat you were training for, whether it was the Chinese or the Russians themselves, where you were expecting something more more sophisticated than just a a bait type ta tactic. Okay. The um, in in my opinion, the answer to that question is no. We were we were training to the, the the I won't say the best tactics they had, but the ones that they they practiced most frequently. And given the low amount of flying time that they were given per year, as opposed to what we were flying per year, then they were doing rote. Uh, tactics uh really uh they were you know heading an altitude timing and turning usually dictated to them by um uh, by uh gci in response to the location of their targets us as we were coming in right uh so no i, I think we trained uh against the appropriate tactics. i don't think they had anything uh in their you know uh, any aces up their sleeves or anything because if they did then when did they practice it and how could they be good at it if they didn't practice it mm. you know it'd be something out of a graphic novel or a comic book mm. uh, rather than rather than a true adversary uh, and actually to be perfectly honest with you I was never that concerned about going across the fence you know let's put us in the in the classic Cold War, uh, you know, East and West Germany, uh, geographically situation. I was never worried about going across the fence and into their territory and fighting them because I knew that they were, they basically were flying interceptor tactics against full of maneuvering fighters. And the same is true in, in Iraq. I did not get to, to, uh, fly in Iraq until after the, after Desert Storm, uh, but reading the, the combat reports of my, my friends who did fly against them, the Iraqis did just as they were trained by the Soviets. They executed mm -hmm. those tactics down to within a mile of 
what the uh, what we were watching them do over East Germany. Um, so I don't think they had anything in their bag of tricks uh, that that uh, would surprise us on if they were on the defensive. If, if we were going in helping uh, the bomb droppers get to their targets and do what they had to do. The, the time when it would be uh, up for grabs, and now it's a wild card, is when we're defending against them. Because if they're beyond their GCI, there is no telling what somebody will do. Mm. You know, now it's back to World War I. Uh, you know, flying over the front. You see it, you know, you see the guy and you go attack him if you don't see anybody else. Uh, so so I was I was more concerned about defending uh, in the, the lanes uh, in the in the NATO air defense uh, plan. Um, as long as they were low and fast, we knew they were bomb droppers. And so it's just a matter of getting in there and killing as many of them as we could before they got to their targets or before they got within our SAM rings, the Hawks and, and the Patriots. And, and they would, then we let the, the Army take care of it. Uh, but uh, so uh, so if, if we if, if they were low and fast because they did not train, they did not practice escorting like we practiced escort. So, so if they sent uh, fulcrums across the fence uh, to... Uh, to cover um, their their strikers, um, their fencers, or whatever, then uh, uh, then they would be at high, relatively high altitude, medium to high altitude, because they didn't have the fuel economy uh, endurance to get very deep and come back. So that they would go higher to save gas, but they were flying cover, right? Well, now it's now it's you know it's a two V X against people that are on our side of the fence with no GCI support. Mm. That doesn't mean, that does not mean that they're easy kills by any means, because, but it is to say that without GCI to tell them where we were and what to do, then there's no telling what they would do. They mm. were unpredictable bandits, right? Whereas before they would be what we called wary bandits. They were aware of us. And they were wary about ranges and angles mm. to try to maintain or try to survive uh, and maybe get a kill, uh, you know, maybe kill an eagle. So anyway, those, those were the guys. That, I wouldn't say they had anything in their in their bag of tricks that we didn't know about, but I would say that they would be dangerous because um, they're unpredictable if uh, they they lack the GCI report, uh, I support. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. It's um, a fighter pilot psychology rather than a, a tactical awareness or anything. T tell me a little bit. You 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 did very quickly reference the fact that you flew um, in a well, you you did fly no fly zone uh, patrol missions as part of right. uh, Northern Watch. You were out of Inchilic, weren't you? When you were the squadron right. boss at uh, thirty tech, at thirty second fighter squadron, as it then was, because it wasn't the TAC fighter squadron after right. nineteen ninety one. I think. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. You, I remember you telling me once that you, you once had a MiG-23 that tried to sort of drag you across the border, trying to maybe pull you into a Samwez, um, yeah. Mez, something like that. I'm really surprised that the Iraqis, because you've, you've written about the MiG-25s, I think, of the Iraqi yeah. Air Force. You, you and Tom Cooper co-wrote something on that. Right. And right. I remember you commenting to me once that the, you know, some of those guys were pretty good. Um, I remember you telling me once about somebody had gone into the beam against one of the year 15s that eventually shot him down. And you said he was unlucky because if he'd held it a bit longer, he probably would have got away. Um, right. But it's surprising then to learn that in the mid nineties, when you were there, the Iraqis hadn't learned anything that they hadn't ad adapted or modified their tactics. Is, is that a, um, am I inferring that correctly or, or is it that they changed them, but they just weren't good enough? I think you are. Yeah. I, I think your statement is correct. Uh, I think that their attrition was so, drastic from desert storm and then the then the lack of ability uh to uh to keep their airplanes operational limited the number of serviceable fighters um i, I think the um uh, their weapon systems and and their warning systems uh uh, uh were were had deteriorated if you uh, had declined to the point where they were completely GCI dependent, uh, and so their their only real 
um, ability was to get airborne, go across the no-fly zone line because that was a violation. They knew that that would that would get uh, uh, clearance for us to to engage by from AWACS when they were, saw that. So that, but their only defense was not to come out and try to execute uh, uh, any tactics, but it was instead instead of being the bait in in a two or a four ship formation where the, the lead element drags, they were the bait to try to get us to come across the, the no fly line. And we could, I mean, the no fly line only applied to them. It didn't apply to us. We could go anywhere we want to in Iraq. But of course, if we're on the, if we're on this, on the south side of the line, then we're not defending the north side of the line. Right. So it's, it's geographic now positioning. So, uh, so, so that there was never any problem. If we wanted to go across the line to investigate something, we could do that. But uh, for a clearance to fire, clearance to engage, they had to come across the line. And sure enough, they'd come across the line, turn tail, and uh, and run. But because they didn't have enough airplanes to put up a trailing element to be the shooters, like I described earlier, mm. they had to rely on the SAM sites. So they would drag. They would they would fly straight across the SAM site. Hoping you would follow, be within the SAM envelope, uh, and they would get a they would get an eagle uh, killed that way. Yep. Can Can I ask you then, and, and then we'll get to the video then, unless there's anything else about you know the no fly zone mission that you you, well, you were not thinking about the no fly zone, but Steve, while you're setting up that video, I got to make another trick. You got to make you can, you can do that. Can I ask you one more question first, and then sure, you, and then we can and then we'll go to it. So, because we're on the subject of you talked about low fast flyers, you talked about we're talking about Iraq. Iraq had the MiG twenty five. We just referenced that. Uh, I read recently uh, a piece about the SR seventy one uh, getting the F fifteen community. This would have been in the seventies, early eighties, to you know practice intercepting it so they could figure out their uh, you know. I don't know who it was. I don't know who's who was going to benefit from it because it sounded like a complete waste of time. Because the, the long and the short of it was that the Eagle never managed to get into a position to shoot um, a simulated missile at a, um, at a an SR seventy one flying at Mark three point two or three point three, whatever it was doing. Three point two, I think, was the the standard operating speed they could go to three point three if they needed to. Um, the MiG twenty five wasn't quite as fast as that unless it wanted to sort of burn out its motors and not not use them again. So I think it was two point eight, two point nine, something like that. It's the figure that yeah, I'm you, aware usually, of. Usually two point five. Two point five and they could use it again. Okay. Um so so what yeah, was the how did you intercept that? How do you deal with a high fast flyer? Why was intercepting a blackbird so difficult? Uh, that's a that's a huge huge question, I know. Maybe you want to get the drink now, but um <laughs> the, and no, it's a very it's a very good question. It's a valid question. Uh, first of all, the parameters for the SR seventy one versus the Fox Bat. Uh, the SR seventy one eighty thousand feet plus a little bit, uh, three point zero Mach three point three. Okay, uh, Fox Bat seventy thousand feet, two miles closer to the Earth's surface, and two point five. A little slower, but when you're doing when you're doing more than more than one point five, you're you know, that's really not worth arguing about, right? But anyway, a little slower, a little lower. <clears throat> the two, the uh, Fox Bat was within the F-15 AIM-7 engagement envelope. The SR-71 was never in it. Right. The AIM-7 could never reach 80,000 feet with enough energy left to explode uh, and 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 even damage an SR-71. Right. What we did, with, in, in anything that you read about between F-15s and SR-71s, was it, was it was training for both sides. The F-15 was the closest thing we, the Americans, had to a fox bat interceptor, or even a fox hound. So the SR-71s would like to go against us to, to practice their, their tactics, which... They're pretty much limited to five to ten degrees of heading change, <laughs> but it has to be done at the right range, yeah. right? Uh, to to because it only takes a little bit to throw the missile way off because the air is so thin. Those little fins on the M seven or even the the Foxhounds uh, missile—I can't remember what they're called now—or the uh, the Fox Bass missile. Those those little fins, the air is so thin up there. Well, look at it this way. We're giving astronaut wings to people that ride in in, in uh, 
in uh, <laughs> in Elon Musk's uh, rocket ship, and they get to they you know they get up above fifty thousand feet, they get astronaut wings, you know, because they're quote no air up there. But anyway, <clears throat> so my point is that that uh, that we were the best at Fox Bat or Foxtown simulator for the SRs to practice against, and they were the best Fox Bat simulator for us to practice against. Did did you have a, a top, an upper limit on the speed gate then and the radar? Because this article, I've sprung it on you. I should have sent it to you before, but I literally just thought of the question. Um, this article said that, the and I, I, I want to say it's 1,500 knots, that the engineers at Hughes had built into the APG-63 a gate that said if you get a return that's more than 1,500 knots, ignore it. And so, therefore, the you wouldn't build a track. The radar wouldn't build a track file for it because it would be filtering it out because it was. It'd be bogus. More, more, for, for, yeah, they thought they thought it was bogus, right? Yeah, it had precisely. to be a bogus return, yeah. right? So, so is there any truth to that? Is, are you aware I don't of, know. No, okay. I don't right. know. Okay. I'm not an engineer, and uh, I don't recall any upper limit. And, and as you'll see, and as you're very well acquainted with, on this on the BSD displays, the closure rate is on the right. Of that display yeah. and you were going to see it be 1100 knots or more yeah. right yeah. well that's 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 against f4s in thick air uh, at or below eighteen thousand feet I, imagine you know making it making it what six times that altitude uh the, the then just just as sheer aerodynamics mean that the uh that an airplane flying it that high uh and with sort of uh speed to to sustain and we're talking about 2.5 to 3.3 here then it's going to be astronomical closure rate hmm. and in fact because the whole thing about a uh, an air to air missile is that that the missile leaves the launching airplane and goes to an intercept point that the target gets it to hmm. if the target turns then now that intercept point is off to one side and the missile may not have the the legs, the actual physical aerodynamic range to get to that point in space, and then the motor quits and it you know it dives for the dirt, and the and that's what that was the secret of the SR seven one tactics was I just need to turn away a little bit to be able to have these missiles run out of poop so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and then I can turn back on back on course once I'm once I'm past it. But anyway, uh, I digress. My point is that uh, I I don't know of any maximum um, speed gate, uh, but I know that the uh, effective ranges of the H seven against a high fast flyer were 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 north of let's say north of forty miles, hmm. sixty something, seventy five, just because the air is so thin. The target so fast approaching the it's approaching its the intercept point on its own so fast, and in the A seven, we we were supposed to be above the mock to launch. We needed to be about one point two. The A the A seven motor would generally add about 0.5 mock to the launcher's speed. So you got a missile going at one point five to one point seven. I guess the target is doing two point five. And the closure rate there, hmm. uh, that's got to be that's got to be north of 4.0, 4.2, something like mock closure rate. That's enormous as long as they both stay on the same track hmm. to one another, to impact one another. Uh, you change the the uh, angular relationship of one, and now the other one's got to compensate for that with, and then and that spoils the intercept. Does so, that make so, sense? Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense, and it's making me think of another question, which is going to delay you getting a drink. But, um, but, but quickly, quickly then. So, so the converse um, perspective on that then is you intercepting a high fast flyer that's maybe threatening a high value asset. So, if you're protecting AWACS or whatever, and this guy's high fast flyer and he's ten degrees off, and you think he's not a factor, and then he turns ten degrees, now, you know, I guess is is it time critical? Um, oh yeah, you know how how you know if you're protecting a I mean, and obviously you're not going to tell us any tactics, uh, but but if you're protecting AWACS, how do you make sure that you're 
you're not caught unawares or you are protecting out some they, other kind of high, high value That's a really asset. good question. See, that's an excellent question. The, the first phase of, a, of an intercept against a high fast flyer is to get on his extended track, his extended radar track. So, so on the very first lockup, you know, actually we're, we're in a regime that's very favorable to the F-15 because the radar has no ground clutter. We're looking up into that bozo sphere, the ionosphere and above. And so the range is, uh, is incredible because of the power of the radar. It's incredibly long. And at those ranges, as you well know, it's all Doppler. It's not, it's not real range. It's looking for whatever the highest speed target. If it could look high enough, it'd get a satellite, you know, at 18,000 miles per hour around the world. Um, so, so you're looking up and, and the, the radar is in its element. It's, it, it's in the purest part of its design element. So it will glob on to a, uh, to a high speed target above the, above you, above the, the launched airplane. And it'll take a little while to sort out the distance because now it's got to go into medium PRF to get distance. This is all high PRF for, for Doppler, right? So, so one, but once that, that target appears on your scope, on your VSD, the very first thing the F-15 has to do is figure out what that aspect is. Uh, now we have the advantage of, of the little vector stick. So we can go, okay, he's pointing to, you know, down to my left knee. I got to get over in front of him, and then turn to to uh, to align fuselages, align flight path vectors, pointing directly at it. And back then, all we had was was a digit uh, and a and a letter. You know, one L meant ten degrees to the left, two R meant twenty degrees to the right. In other words, and that's his vector. It's not uh, that's where he's headed. So if he is, if we get a 1L, because GCI will do their best to put us on his uh, program track. And of course, if we know where the high value asset is, then of course we get in between it and the Fox Bat. Uh, more frequently though, than a, than a high fast flyer intercept machine for a high value asset was the, uh, was the photo recon Fox Bats. Those are much more frequent. Uh, in any event, GCI would put you in the ballpark, and then your first lockup, first thing you look at in key off of is the what the uh, what that uh, the target's heading was relative to you pointing directly at it, and and if it was ten degrees to the left, then you got over there as quickly as you could. I mean, you'd pull over and you just break the lock. Doesn't matter because you'll get them again. You'll find them again. <clears throat> so you pull over there. You, you go away, you pull back to, to point it at him because, again, GCI is telling you where he's at. Roll that radar up, grab the, grab the, uh, the contact, and, and you got to be careful because you're already so, so high that it's easy to bleed the airspeed off. It, well, it's easy to bleed the mock off with a hard turn. Yeah, they're so thin, blah, 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 blah. You know, now you're below the mock and, and you got to accelerate all over again. Um, so, so you wanted to make a, a 1.1 mock turn of let's say 30 to 45 degrees to get over on his anticipator track and then turn back and as soon as you're pointed at him using gci roll that radar up grab him again and hopefully it's showing us a zero if it's a zero you're dead on his nose okay unless he turns you got you you will have a firing solution if he mm -hmm. turns you won't he, he will he can avoid you by, as I mentioned for the SR-71, by making a simple 10 to 15 degree turn. For the SR-71, it's 5 to 10. For the Fox Bat, if he made a 10 to 15 degree turn, he would spoil the, the uh, solution. And that's also why we would take a force ship, and we would, instead of being the usual you know, mile, mile and a half liner breast, we would be in like two and a half to five mile liner breast. That way, it was like, okay, we're going to make this net really wide. One of us is going to be on his nose, yeah. right? That increases the chances of a successful intercept. If you, the more fighters you put up, the better your chances of uh, of uh, getting an intercept against somebody like that, whose uh, performance is so so great that you have a very small, very marginal.
capability of intercepting even to begin with. And we would practice this every six months in the simulator. There was a high fast flyer profile that, that the simulator instructor could program in, and you weren't allowed to get out of that container, out of that box, so to speak, until you had shot him down. It didn't right. it didn't matter how many times you had to repeat it. But but that was it. You you lock him up, evaluate the the, the heading, or at really the words aspect angle. They evaluate the aspect angle, pull, get on it, pull, roll off the radar, um, correct it if you need another correction. And then and then you get as many missiles in the air as possible. Hmm. I mean, you're only getting one pass at this guy, so might as well come home empty. <laughs> 